happens when the world's biggest iceberg crashes into an island. Are the consequences good or bad for the wildlife? And what are the long-term effects? We're going to find out in detail here on Induna. In a dramatic turn of events, the world's most massive iceberg, A23A, has run aground near the remote British territory of South Georgia, just north of the Antarctic continent. We're going to see why this is important for the wildlife of the area, and especially to the penguins of South Georgia. And we'll find out how A23A and large icebergs in general get their name. A23A is a colossal slab of ice, roughly the size of Rhode Island or twice as big as London. It's easily visible from space and contains almost as much water as Canada's Lake Ontario. Like all large icebergs, it has been tracked since it broke off the Antarctic shelf. It's been on a 40-year journey since it left in 1986, although much of that time it was stuck on the sea floor in the Weddell Sea, not far from where it carved off the Filkner ice shelf. But in 2020, Iceberg 23A took off again and started drifting north at about 3 miles an hour. It got stuck in an ocean vortex or gyre for most of 2024, but then it escaped from that to land on South Georgia 2,000 miles from where it originally had broken off in 1986, and where it now lies at the beginning of March 2025. Scientists are now wondering what it means for the local ecosystem and the world at large. Is it a good or bad thing for South Georgia and its wildlife? As the iceberg melts, it releases millions of gallons of fresh water into the ocean each day. It's fresh because it's made from what's called glacial ice, ice that forms from compacted snow, falling for millions and millions of years and compressing under its own weight. But that's not all. The weight of those glaciers grinding against the stone of Antarctica have infused it with minerals, nutrients, which are really useful. And for all of those millions of years, atmospheric dust has fallen on top of the glacier, which itself is full of nutrients. So when the glacier carves off and becomes an iceberg, it's like having a giant fertilizer pellet floating in the sea. Iron can be in short supply in the ocean, so when it and other nutrients become abundant, it kicks off what's called a massive phytoplankton bloom, so big that a green haze can be seen around icebergs from space. Phytoplankton are the base of the marine food web, and they thrive in these nutrient-rich conditions. In turn, zooplankton, everything from the larvae of crabs to small crustaceans, tiny things called copepods are found in their hundreds of trillions in the water and most importantly the small shrimp-like crustaceans called krill which are among the most abundant animals on earth the most well-known species antarctic krill can form swarms so dense they turn the water reddish pink the total biomass of krill in the antarctic alone is estimated to be several hundred million tons and krill are a crucial food source for many marine species, including whales, seals, fish, and penguins. South Georgia is home to millions of penguins. There are at least a million breeding pairs of macaroni penguins, two million individuals. And of the most impressive king penguin, the second biggest species in the world after the emperor penguin, of course. There were found to be 400,000 breeding pairs on South Georgia. And the rest of the numbers are made up from the so-called gentoo penguins and chin straps. Each penguin species has unique adaptions to their environment. The king penguins, known for their striking orange patches on their necks and chests, but they're not just a pretty face, they're impressive hunters and can travel quite far from their breeding colonies to find food. They typically forage at sea for extended periods, sometimes covering distances of up to 300 miles, maybe 500 kilometers from their nesting sites. So 
the iceberg and the potential productivity it brings is well within their range. During these foraging trips they repeatedly dive to depths of over 100 metres, 330 feet, and have been recorded diving as deep as 300 metres, that's nearly a thousand feet, where they're probably hunting squid down there. But they're also catching fish like the abundant lanternfish and crustaceans like krill. Their ability to travel long distances and dive deep allows them to access these rich feeding grounds, ensuring they can provide enough food for themselves and their chicks. It's a remarkable hunting strategy, but it's essential for their survival in the harsh subantarctic environment. King penguins also have an unusual and irregular breeding cycle, one that's well adapted to the changeable conditions down here, rearing about two chicks every three years on average, but being able to take advantage of increases in food in the sea, so they may well benefit from the iceberg. Macaroni, Gentoo and Chinstrap penguins, on the other hand, don't travel as far and generally prefer ice-free waters and time will tell whether that big iceberg gets in their way. We are of course not certain how it's going to play out, but it will be different for each species. Macaroni penguins, by the way, get their name from the first explorers of the 1700s because they were familiar with the so-called macaroni men, swaggering, big-haired, sharply-dressed show-offs who had yellow feathers in their hair. Not a word used today, of course, but it stuck for the macaroni penguin. And it's thought Gentoo penguins may have got their name from that white patch above the eye, which some people think alludes to them wearing a kind of turban. Well, chin straps, I think you can work out yourself. So, as far as nutrient or added fertilizer goes in the sea, the giant iceberg's grounding may well be a good short-term gain. But there are also a few reasons why it might not be so great. As already mentioned, depending on where exactly it's landed, if it forces the penguins to travel longer distances to get food, it'll wear them out, and their chicks won't do as well but currently there might be reasons to be optimistic. The giant iceberg has got stuck on the shelf around South Georgia, about 50 miles away from the island. You can see where it's got stuck on that dotted line, the raised seabed around South Georgia. However, local fisheries may well get concerned if this large lump of ice blocks their path to their normal fishing grounds. And underwater, there's another problem too. Although the iceberg, the biggest in the world, is vast, so is the sea. And it's pushed by the water and rotates and grinds against the seabed. It bulldozes everything in its path, destroying delicate marine habitats. They will eventually regrow, but it's quite a blow. Coral sea slugs, sponges and other seafloor organisms are all crushed under the weight of the ice. But there are some concerns too as to what all the fresh water from an iceberg the size of Lake Ontario is going to do. Because it's lighter, all that fresh water might sit on top of the surface and some scientists think that it could block the flow of nutrients and change the currents in unpredictable ways. Another supergiant iceberg, A68A, broke up around South Georgia in 2021. The effects were noticed 600 miles away for over two months. So from the initial nutrient bonanza, conditions might become difficult in the long term for the inhabitants of South Georgia. And even if they can forage for hundreds of miles for their chicks, they'll be exhausted if the food moves too far away. A23A has stayed remarkably intact over the last 40 years. But once 4,000 square miles almost, it's now lost about a quarter of that mass as it's moved into northern, warmer water. But it is showing signs of decay with large caverns round the edges. And the ice underneath, eroded by salt water for all of those years, is probably rotten. And with tidal action, it's quite likely that it'll break up into lots of smaller pieces quite soon.
and some of those chunks might get released from the shelf around South Georgia and they could be a hazard to shipping although if they move north they'll melt quickly. By the way as I promised to explain earlier icebergs are named after the quadrant in which they were first discovered. Since 1978 the US National Ice Center USNIC has been tracking large icebergs They've got to be at least 10 nautical miles, about 19 kilometers long, so all the ones that get a name are quite large. The quadrants are divided into four regions, A, B, C and D, as you can see here. A and B are on the west, and D and C are on the east. Each iceberg is assigned a sequential number based on its order of discovery. For example, A23A was the 23rd iceberg tracked in quadrant A. If an iceberg breaks into smaller pieces, each piece is given a letter suffix, such as A23A and A23B, 14, etc. So you can expect many more numbers pretty soon. As I say, it's only icebergs that are notable of a huge size that attract. Of course, there's plenty more small ones, but they don't have numbers. To put the size of A23A into perspective, it's currently 1,300 feet 400 meters high. That's the total height from the seabed to the top of the iceberg. So it's quite a bit higher than the tallest skyscraper in Europe, the London Shard. It highlights the immense scale of the iceberg and the potential impact of its melting on the whole of the marine environment and all of the southern seas. The grounding of iceberg A23A near South Georgia is a complex event with both positive and negative consequences. But while it brings a nutrient boost to the local ecosystem, it also poses significant challenges to marine life and human activities. And as we continue to grapple with the impacts of climate change, understanding these events is crucial for our future. Over the course of the coming months, I hope to update you on what's happening with A23A and the wildlife of South Georgia, here on Induna.